Our loving Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the work that is going on in this city. We thank you so much, Lord God, for, for each person who's involved in uh, reaching out in Jesus' name to the folks that we, uh, that we know that you long to reach out and, and, and meet with. Lord, we bless the work of Edinburgh City Mission. We bless the work, though, of all of the partner organizations that are here, for every other organization, every other church in this city that longs to see the kingdom of God grow and expand in this place, that no one would be excluded, no one would be too far beyond the bounds of the reach of the church, that actually that we would reach out beyond into these spaces and everyone would know, every person, wherever they come from, whatever their circumstances, they would know that they are loved in Jesus' name, invited into a new and living way through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, Lord God, we pray for your blessing upon this time and upon this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, you're safe to sit down now. Thank you very much for <laughs> indulging me in that. Um, we're thinking today about the whole thing of how do we love our neighbor and uh, and uh, this morning, uh, we're, Diana and I are going to sort of kind of double act the thing. Uh, she's going to speak this afternoon. I'm going to speak this uh, this morning. Uh, and, and we want to say that actually we believe that the way that we're going to love our neighbors is actually to see transforming faith communities, churches, uh, transforming faith communities who then transform their communities. We believe that the church is the agent of change that will see the kingdom come and will see this, this city transformed. We really believe in that. And so to, uh, this, this afternoon, uh, Dan's going to speak a bit more about the kind of, what would it look like? How can we make that happen? The practical kind of like, okay, how do we get this on the ground into the uh, reality of people's lives? Uh, but to, this morning, I want to talk about the, um, the, the whole thing of how can we see transforming faith communities, dynamic churches and Christian organizations which, uh, which spread out right across the city and across the nation. Uh, and I do that really um, recognizing that actually that there's a huge challenge for us at the moment. Uh, I, if you were, if you were kind of like, we, we came in from Glasgow today and we drove along uh, from, the, from, the, from the west of the city in the way and uh, no, that must have been from East. Oh, I can't remember. Uh, anyway, that side we came in the way, and we drove past church after church after church after church. And I'm conscious of the fact that within the next couple of years, at least every third or fourth of those churches will be closed, sold off for other things. We are in a very difficult and challenging place for the broader church. There's lots of amazing churches in Edinburgh. Lots of great things that God is doing, but we are also facing a very, very stiff opposition. That's the reality. That's the, that's the truth. And in the midst of that, I want to sort of say, I believe that God is doing something to en enliven his church again, to say, how can we become transforming faith communities? How can we be bold? How can we be courageous? How can we be creative? How can we, uh, how can we do all of that? And I think that the first thing that, that, that uh, I want to say about that is the, the way that we get into that place is that we posture ourselves correctly in understanding what God is doing and we posture ourselves in a way that makes sense and actually allows him to be able to use us. And so when we do that, I want to start by just kind of uh, taking a, a moment or two just in scripture. So we're going to read together for this, uh, this first passage from John. Um, so if we can have that up, that'd be great. Okay, I am the true vine and my father is a gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does not bear fruit, uh, sorry, but while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So here's the thing. In the midst of all sorts of significant changes that are happening in the church, the broad church in Scotland and in Edinburgh in particular, we need to recognize that actually just now God is pruning the vine okay? There are parts which are not fruitful, and there are parts which are not working, and actually he is actively involved in the process. He has not lost control of what's going on in the church in Scotland. He knows what he's doing, and one of the things I think if we're going to be involved in actually kind of stepping into becoming transforming faith communities is actually that we would start from a place of surrender and submission to the plans and purposes of God, that actually, that we can trust God, that he knows what he's doing. And, and here's the hard thing, though. 
that we would not resist the pruner's hook. That we would not resist the pruner's hook. That where he comes and says, actually, I want to see some change here in your life, in my life, in your church, in my church, in your ministry, in my ministry, that we don't resist them. That we do not stop and we don't say, no, 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 you can't touch that. You can't touch that. You can't touch that. No, please, not that. The Lord knows what he's doing. So the first thing I want to say this is this. If we're going to see these new transforming faith communities, we start in the place, the posture of submission and surrender to the king. Okay? Second thing, second scripture I want to kind of take us to uh, is, is from Judges uh, chapter 7. Early in the morning, uh, Gideon and all his men camped at the spring of Harad. The camp of Midian was north of them in the, in the valley near the hill of Moreh. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into your hands or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down into the water and I will thin them out for you there. If I say this one shall go, then he'll go. If I say this one shall not, uh, this one shall not go with you, he will not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap with water with their tongues as a dog laps uh, from those who kneel down to drink. 300 of them drank with cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. And the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and I will give you the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. We are in a situation where we are going to have to see the church uh, much more as an army of 300 than what we have at the moment. Uh, you know, the, the, the reality is that actually the, the, those who, the, the reality is when Gideon called the army out, there should have been half, about a quarter of a million soldiers turned out. That's, that's actually, the, the 32,000 wasn't the right number. Actually, there should have been nearly a quarter of a million. That's how many fighting men there were at that stage in the life of Israel. But they didn't turn. They didn't want to fight. They weren't interested. They were disinterested. They wanted to stay at home. They wanted to do their own thing. Fine. And I think that that's part of what's going on. God is actually sort of saying, I need people who are like the 300. I, I, and if you're fearful, go home. That's okay. If you are, and, and if you're distracted or if you're not focused or if you're not attentive to the things of God, then I'm, I don't want either. God is calling uh, us into, an, into a level of radical commitment to him, which allows us to be able to say when he speaks to us that we will do it. Now, why is this important? Because of what happened next. What happened next was that you ended up in a situation where God said to, the, the, to these 300, against this uh, army of Midianites who were like kind of like you know sand in the sea in front of them like uh, I want you to go and I want you to here's the plan the plan is go to the top of a hill take a torch take a trumpet and then when I say I want you to charge down the hill blowing your trumpet showing your torch and shouting for Gideon in the Lord that's the plan and with that plan I am going to put the Midianites into uh, they're, they're going to flee they're going to run and we look at this and we kind of hear this story because we know this story and we kind of think, oh yeah, that's, that's the obvious thing to do. That's, that's the, well, obvi well, obviously that's the thing to do. Uh, no, it's not the obvious thing to do. It's a ridiculous thing to do. It's a ridiculous thing to do. And you know who the people who are willing to do ridiculous things when God speaks? It's those who are completely surrendered and submitted to his will. How are we going to see these new things that need to happen happen? It's not going to be uh, with, with folks who are kind of like unsure or, you know, that, that, that faith is somehow something else, some other part of their life. It is those who, God is calling us into a level of surrender, into a level of submission, which will only be uh, the, the, the pathway into the new things that he wants for us. So I think that if we're going uh, to see uh, new things happening, then I think that the first thing we need to sort out is our, our posture, submission, surrender. 
But then I think that the, the, the next two things I want to sort of say are, are I, I believe very much that what we need to see is we need to see a release of the creativity of God uh, amongst the people of God. Uh, I believe that actually for us to see the whole of our city and the whole of our nation impacted with the good news of Jesus Christ, I believe that the answers to the questions of how that's going to happen are already in the room, are already embedded in your hearts and minds, are already filling your dreaming moments where you have a wee thought where you think, oh, I wonder if. I believe that actually that, that God has already seeded into the church a whole series of answers to the profound questions that the society are asking and which the church alone will have the answer to. One of my friends is a lady called Betsy, and Betsy is a psychotherapist. She used to kind of get lots of people coming into her uh, counseling room. And the thing that she, she said was, I realized after a while that there was, and she said the phrase she used was, there was a tsunami of trauma had been released. And we were being overwhelmed by this trauma. And, and she really kind of said, you know, the, the, I, I need a better answer for these folks. I need to actually kind of know how to engage with them. And so as a result of that, she studied and did various things. She began to actually, uh, she began to kind of realize that there is a way to be able to actually help people through trauma, which actually will bring release. And if any of you have been to trauma-informed training, anyone been to trauma-informed training? If you're in social work education or, you know, lots of other things, you'll have been in trauma. Betsy created the phrase trauma-informed. She was the one that started all of that. Trauma-informed training, essentially helping people to get over, to deal with, to work out how to live and to go through the whole experience of trauma. But what then happened was this. She then began to get invited to help, uh, not just in the church, but in the society and community. She got invited by the police she's, uh, to, to come and help with uh, complicated incidents where there have been trauma. She's going and helping with education. She's helping with other folks. And now she's beginning to sort of see that the wider world is beginning to understand that actually the church, her and what she carries, actually is bringing an answer to a question which they are asking. They're asking the question, how do we deal with trauma? It is just rife. It is coming out in all sorts of different uh, directions. And here is this woman of God who has, has this idea maybe there's something that the church could actually offer here. Maybe we actually have something which will, which will uh, address this deep uh, societal need. And as a result of that, she's now being consulted by, uh, by governments. So uh, the Scottish government consulted with her recently. There's now a thing called the Bairns Hoos. I don't know if you've heard of the Bairns Hoos, but it's a new trauma recovery center that's happening in Scotland led by this lady. She's driving it from, from uh, uh, the back, as it were, but funded by the Scottish government to the tune of two or three million pounds. I don't know, it's a lot of money. And there will be more that will come. She's working in 32 different countries. She's seeing all of that uh, coming. Why? Because not only did she say, I believe it's important for us to be able to help people who have trauma so that we would have trauma-informed churches and trauma-informed youth work and all the other things that come with that. But she said, I believe that it's possible for people to recover. I believe it's possible for people not to continue to have to live in traumatized lives in the way that they have. It's possible to live. And she knows that because Jesus said, I have come to give you life and life in all its fullness. And so as a result of that, that work is multiplying out and out and out and out. Why am I telling you that? I'm telling you that because if we're going to see transforming faith communities, they are going to, they are going to look different from what they've looked at, look like uh, coming till now. They're going to look like people like Betsy and her army of kind of trauma-informed and trauma recovery counselors who are bringing the message of, of the good news of Jesus Christ in ways that this community, this, our society is desperate for. And why am I saying that? I'm saying it because I believe that the same thing that Betsy carries is in many of us here today. There are solutions to questions that people are asking. People are asking the question about isolation. They're asking the question about how do we deal with loneliness. The, and, and, you know, I'm listening, to your, I'm listening to your video and I'm thinking, this, this, this organization actually carries some of the keys that will transform the whole of your city. 
and indeed beyond your city. Let's not be scared about these things. Let's not, but let's release the creativity, the, the deep-seated ideas that God has given to us. And I want to encourage you just now uh, to, to say, what is it that I carry? What is it that I carry? What is it that God has placed in me? What is the thing that actually, in my wildest moments, I think, do you know, if other people got this, then it would really help. <laughs> and I, I give you just a, brief, a very brief other example. So the, another example was I, I, we were in we were in White Inch in Glasgow, and uh, we were we were doing lots of stuff to do with um, we we're doing lots of stuff in the church to do with forgiveness. So we were teaching on forgiveness. We were sort of saying, you know, this is how you, so because we don't want to live in unforgiveness. We don't want to, because that binds us up. It causes us to become bitter and, and resentful. It causes us to struggle in terms of relationships. And, and actually, we were being taught how to get rid of all of that stuff, how to live in good relationships with one another, how to deal with the, the whole question of forgiving and restoring and having healthy relationships. And after a, a wee while, one of the folks who were involved in teaching it in the church, she said, I wonder whether or not if we offered this like as a, a night, uh, like a kind of a, a, maybe two or three nights in the local community center, I wonder if anyone from outside the church would be interested. And the answer is, we were overwhelmed. We were overwhelmed. Things that we think, oh, that's just church stuff. That's just Christianity, 101, how to forgive, how to build healthy relationships. We began to offer it out into the kind of community, and we began to sort of say to them, would you like to kind of work out how to forgive one another? Do you want to know how to deal with good relationships? We, we kind of do that in the church. And they went, you do? We went, yeah, we do. And we began to offer it, and it began to really kind of impact our community. Why am I saying that? I'm saying it because we carry things. What is it that you carry? What is it that you carry? So I think that there needs to be a submission, a surrender, a posture that holds us there. Then I think there needs to be a release of creativity. But here's the last thing I want to say. I also think that there needs to be a huge courage released within the body of Christ to be bold again, to offer again the gospel of Jesus Christ to the community that's around about us and to do so not on the back foot, but on the front foot, not just sort of saying, well, please, if you would let us, but actually it's just saying, look, we're here and we actually think it's important. We carry something which, which, is, which, which we believe is unique and which actually will bring solutions to your community. And I want to encourage us today to be courageous in these things. And, and, and on a very sort of simple level, here's an example again from Glasgow. We were in, we were in, uh, in the East End in Rakesi and, and, and one of the church in that situation, the local community council, no, the local city council, Glasgow city council came to me and she said, Alan, um, would the church be interested in helping to start a food pantry? So kind of like an advanced food bank, but with more dignity and, and so on. It's just a, a different model and a better model of thinking. And what she said was, the church, this church, is the only local anchor organization that can actually make this happen. And I thought about that for a minute and I thought, really? And she said, yeah, because... There's nobody, and this is one of the poorest communities, so there's no community council here. Um, the housing association aren't interested in this kind of stuff. Um, the, the city council can't drive it forward because we have other agendas that we're not allowed to kind of mix up with. You're it. Local church, you're it. You are, in this poor area, the only local anchor organization who can drive forward the kind of project that's actually going to help with the kind of levels of food insecurity and poverty in our community. Would, and then she said, if I was able to help you with that, would you be interested in doing it? And we said, well, let's just take a moment or two. Th no, I said, yeah, of course, of course. And over the next kind of couple of years, we began to kind of develop the project, began to build partners with Fair Share, with the local kind of housing associations with the local schools, with all the other folks, and got funding in place. And we established a, a, a food pantry, which essentially is a shop. It looks like a shop, feels like a shop. You go in, but you actually get, uh, for £2.50, you get £15 worth of food. It's a beautiful, 
great system. So if you've not come across food pantries, you should go and have a look at that. Um, but we started that, and as a result of that, there are now 2,000 families which are accessing that food pantry on a monthly basis and addressing the fact that actually in our area, um, we had kids that our, 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 our kids were, 41% of the kids were under the poverty level, you know, two of every, out of every five in that community. And now they're beginning to eat <laughs> properly. They can afford to do that. Why? Because the church was willing to say, we will step forward into a space that perhaps others don't want to step forward into. We are willing to be courageous and to say, we are here and we are going to stay and we are going to offer ourselves into that space of transformation. And so I want to encourage us to step into these things. How are we going to see our neighbor loved? We're going to see our neighbor loved when we are willing to start by saying, I am going to surrender to the plans and purposes of God, submit, go low. But then in that posture to say, I'm willing to be creative. I'm willing to be courageous. I'm willing to step forward into this. We need that. And you know, this organization that we've come to think about, these other organizations, they're already doing it. So let's, let's work together in that. But there is much, much more that is required. There are areas of culture and society which this organization, these organizations are not going to get to. But you might. It might be in education. It might be in health. It might be in government. It might be in business. It could be in law. It could be in all sorts of different places that you carry the kingdom solution and I'm encouraging you today to be creative and courageous and to step forward and to make things happen because you are God's plan A and there is no plan B. Father, we thank you. We thank you so much for the fact that you are working amongst us. You are stirring our hearts. You are releasing faith. You are releasing hope and expectation. And Lord God, we want to pray that today here amongst us, that there would be just that bubbling up within us of, oh God, oh God, oh God, really is this thing that you've put in my heart, the thing that you want to do? And Lord, I pray for those who feel like that just now, that you would pour fuel on the fire that is within them, that they would not allow that to go die, die down, but instead it would burst into life and into flame, Lord God, and that they would carry something of the kingdom and they would understand that you're calling them into that place of releasing that creative idea, being courageous and offering themselves. And as I do that, Lord, I thank you that the kingdom is going to advance and advance and advance in ways perhaps it's not up till now, different places, different ways. But Lord God, we trust you that you know what you're doing and you are in charge and you are working your purposes out and so Lord God we surrender and we submit to you to your ways today and we say Lord would you have your way we we want you to be glorified we want you to be honored we want you to be lifted high Jesus King Jesus name above all names we worship you and praise you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.